The rain patters incessantly against the hiker's hood, the sound that has been accompanying her for the last four hours of walking through the Blue Ridge Mountains. Just that noise and the squelch of her shoes as they tread their way up the gravel path. It doesn't help that it's now almost pitch black. Come to Blue Ridge. You'll love it here. We can go out together. Yeah, right. Her friend had bailed on her at the last minute, taking half of their equipment with her so the hiker had to buy herself a whole new tent and sleeping bag that morning. Now, as she trudges her way up yet another trail in the pouring rain, she seriously wonders if it was worth the trip out to Virginia. She is so absorbed by the rain and the darkness that she fails to see the man walking towards her until the last second. He isn't coming along the path, not at all. Instead, he is marching straight up the ridge on her right, making a beeline for her. He is dressed in ragged waterproof clothes that catch and tear on the bushes as he pushes his way through them. He closes the gap to her startlingly fast, so quickly in fact that she has to jump back out of his way to stop him from walking right into her. She catches her heel on a rock and loses her balance, landing squarely on her tailbone. A dull ache shoots up her torso, enough to wind her. But as she gasps for air, the man just walks right on past. He crosses the path and strides up the embankment to the left, disappearing into the woods without so much as a glance back at her. By the time she's got the air in her lungs to call out at him indignantly, he's long gone. Her breath doesn't fully come back, though. Some part of her feels rattled. As she gets up, feeling that familiar squelch in her boots and continues along the trail, she can't quite settle her lungs into their normal pattern. She walks another mile or so, but the anxiety doesn't go away. That settles it. She won't camp on her own tonight. There's a hostel just up the ridge that she can go to. It might be quiet because of the weather, but there will at least be some company there. The last thing she wants is to be a woman camping alone with a strange man marching around the woods like that. Safety in numbers. And numbers there are. As she approaches the hostel, she spots a small gang of tents surrounding it. There is a little canopy outside with an open fire underneath. Rain-bedraggled campers huddle around the flames like a group of waterlogged moths. Their brightly colored raincoats are draped heavily over their shoulders, lit up eerily by the orange glow. The nearest guy, in a blue coat, waves her over and explains that the hostel is already full. Apparently hikers have been flocking to the building all day to escape the rain. Some of them are too exhausted and wet to say a word just heading straight inside and sitting in a bunk. They are packed in there like sardines, apparently. Definitely a fire hazard. The smell in there, he explains, is unbelievable. She has probably dodged a bullet being late and having to camp outside. A girl from the group gets up and shows the hiker to a good spot, raised slightly above the puddles that threaten to turn the grass into a swamp. The hiker thanks her and starts to set up her new tent. It goes terribly. She's never set up one like it before. Whoever designed it had clearly never gone camping in the rain. The inner has to go up first before she puts the outer rain cover over it, so right away, her room for the night has been drenched in rainwater. Perfect. She throws her bag inside and hurries back over to the fire, eager to get out of the rain for a bit. There's quite a crowd gathered around the fire. They mostly just sit in silence, only a handful of campers keeping the conversation going. Many of the strangers don't say a word at all, just sit there staring into the flames. The hiker does the same for the longest time, just enjoying the feeling of having her hood down, the warmth at her wrinkled fingertips, and a bit of human company around her. After what feels like an hour, the guy in the blue coat asks if anyone wants to hear a ghost story. Immediately, four different people start yelling at him to stop being such a cliché. They're grown adults. Surely they can have a normal conversation around a campfire at night without having to reach for such low-hanging fruit. They can't. A woman starts things off. She talks about a boy from her school who'd gone missing up in these mountains years ago. On the night of his junior prom, he'd skidded off the road and down a ravine. No one ever found the body. Then, as if by magic, he'd appeared at his girlfriend's house on the following year's prom night, dressed in the same clothes he'd gone missing in. But when her parents came to wake her up in the morning, he had mysteriously vanished. No one finds it particularly scary. Someone else jumps in with a story of his own. Similar theme, really. A cousin had a friend who knew someone who owned a kayak that he'd capsized on some rapids. Ten years later, he turned up at a campsite in the middle of the night, and so on and so on. Safe to say, none of the ghost stories are any good. The hiker stops listening, staring into the flames and letting her mind drift. She can't help but let her mind drift back to the man from earlier. The hiker shudders involuntarily. One of the campers around the fire asks if she's okay. She tells them it's just the rain. That man. Something had been seriously wrong with him dressed in tattered waterproof clothes, walking in such a straight line, totally ignoring her. Not just ignoring her, but nearly walking through her. Should she tell someone? 
Maybe he's still somewhere out there. Maybe he's sick. She should say something. The hiker sits herself up straight and looks around the circle. She's just opening her mouth to speak when she freezes. There he is. The man, sitting two places to her left. How had she missed him? Rain drips from his hood and runs down his sleeves. He isn't looking at her. He isn't looking at anything. Just staring straight ahead at something beyond the fire. Is everything okay? The guy in the blue coat asks, noticing the hiker's discomfort. She gathers herself and tells him everything is fine, but the interruption is enough to kill the conversation. An uneasy atmosphere settles over the campfire. No one knows quite what to say. The only sounds are the crackle of the campfire and her breathing. She can hear it speeding up again, her lungs falling out of rhythm, out of sync with her body, in sync with her growing panic. Is he following her? It's too much. The hiker excuses herself and gets up from the fire. She walks in the direction of her tent, but with every step, she finds her lungs falling further out of rhythm. Breathe in, breathe out. Simple as that. One breath in, one breath out. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Is he behind her? Is he? She wheels around. No. No, he is still sitting with the crowd staring into the fire, just like the lady next to him and the young kid next to her. In fact, half of the people sitting around the fire don't seem to be moving at all. In fact, none of those people looking into the fire have said a word all evening. Not a laugh, not a smile, nothing. And come to think of it, there must be 11 of them sitting around that fire, but there are only five tents set up out here. A figure emerges out of the darkness so suddenly it makes her jump. He can't be more than a few feet away from her, but in the darkness, she would never have guessed he was there. This new stranger walks straight past her, over to the fire, and takes her empty spot. No introductions, no asking if that space was taken. He just sits down. Quietly as she can, the hiker walks back over to the group, careful to hang back just out of the flickering glow of the fire. She watches as the newcomer takes the exact same pose as the others sitting around the fire, blank expression, staring straight ahead. The guy in the blue coat welcomes the new guest. No response. He puts an arm around the stranger. Nothing. He asks if he's okay. Had a long day? Silence. The concern seems to register on the guy's face, and indeed on the faces of the others sitting around the fire. Or rather, on half of the faces of those sitting around the fire. The other half just carries on staring into the flames. The faces. There's something strange about their faces. Their skin it isn't just rain-soaked and cold, it looks slightly bloated sallow, like a thin layer of plastic wrapped too tightly around a piece of meat that had been forgotten about. All of a sudden, the guy in the blue coat stands up sharply. I'm going to bed, he announces in a slightly choked voice. I... Then he runs, scrambling away from the fireside and out into the rain. The hiker catches up to him and grabs his arm. He wheels around and stares at her with wild eyes, looking her up and down, then pulls away, heading for the door to the hostel. From behind her, the hiker hears the others from around the fire all getting up to leave too. And this time, it really is everyone. Even the strangers with their bloated skin. Everyone is getting up. She turns back to Bluecoat and implores him to let her come and stay in the hostel for the night. She doesn't feel safe out here anymore. He just shakes his head at her, mouthing noiselessly. His eyes lock with something over her shoulder. She spins around to see the stranger, the newest one to join them at the fire. He's right behind her, inches from her face. The smell hits her. It isn't overwhelming, but it is there, sure enough. The smell of rotting meat, barely making it to her nostrils as if it was seeping through the gaps of a closed dumpster. The stranger does not look at her, though. He raises a lazy arm and pushes her out of the way, eyes fixed on the door to the hostel. Blue Coat drops all pretense and starts running for the door. He reaches it, dives inside, and slams the door hard behind him. The stranger continues to walk to the door, all the way to the doorstep, then stops. Another of the strangers joins him. Then the stranger with the tattered waterproofs. Then the others, seven figures standing by the doorway, not knocking, shouting, or doing anything at all, just waiting patiently, as if at any moment someone will come and let them in. The hiker stands motionless. She holds her breath. Maybe they've forgotten that she's here. She glances around back over to the fire. The others seem lost as to what to do. All of them are right on the verge of running, only there's nothing to run from. The strangers aren't doing anything. They aren't even looking at them, just waiting by the door to the hostel. The hiker, still holding her breath, creeps over to the group. Three girls, including herself, and two guys. They all exchange silent looks of fear with one another. Maybe they're overreacting. Maybe these strangers don't speak English. Maybe they're just exhausted from the wet weather and acting strangely because they've become a little delirious. Maybe it's all just one big prank. Maybe, maybe, maybe. 
After a long time, they stand like that, the five of them huddling near to the fire, the strangers waiting by the door to the hostel, no one speaking, no one moving. The fire sputters and shrinks the longer they stand there. The strangers remain totally still. Creepy? Yes. But nothing bad has happened. No one is being attacked. No one's in danger. Maybe they are overreacting after all. Tiredness sets in. It must be 2 a.m., maybe 3. Would it be crazy to just go to bed? Those strangers, odd as they are, are not actually doing anything. And it's so dark and so cold. Maybe if they just get into their tents and go to bed, everyone would be gone by the morning. So that's what they do. Agreeing with their plan in hushed whispers, the hiker volunteers to go last. The others all get their things and disappear into their tents as she stands to watch. None of the seven strangers by the door move. They just wait there patiently, expressionless, slightly bloated, waiting to be let inside. Finally, it is her time to go to bed. Quickly as she can, she unzips the door and ducks inside. The zip is loud, much louder than she expected. Stupid new tent, so loud that as she closes it behind herself, she sees the stranger in the tattered coat turning to look at her through the closing gap. Then nothing. She's on her own. Finally. She's holding her breath again, and through what she thought were impenetrable canvas walls comes a sound, just audible over the pattering rain. Footsteps. A shadow falls over the tent. The zipper slowly drags its way open. The rainy wind blows in, carrying with it the stench of rotten meat as the stranger crouches down and crawls into the tent. There isn't space in there for the both of them. He crawls virtually onto her lap, his face inches from hers, looking right at her, but not seeing her at all. Now she is breathing hard and fast, shallow breaths that rack her lungs and send her whole body into convulsions and heave that horrible smell into her nose. More footsteps. The whole tent lurches to the side as another one of the strangers crawls in, stretching the canvas out to the left. He puts a heavy, clammy palm directly onto her arm, absently pinning her down. Once he's in, just like the other stranger, he just stops and waits. The third one forces his way into the tent. The hiker is now lying flat on her back, half pinned down. There's nowhere left for her to go. There is physically no space left in the tent. There's no air to breathe, nothing but these strangers. Footsteps surround her, yelps from the other tents, zips opening, poles bending, then silence. Nothing but the patter of rain as the five campers lie there closed in by these seven strangers. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, rotten meat, breathe out. The hiker lies there totally still as panic attack after panic attack racks her body as the strangers in her tent do nothing. Time warps out of shape. She has no idea how long it has been, but every so often, a new set of footsteps will march themselves purposefully up to the entrance of her tent, and a new shadow will join those encircling her. How many are there now? She can count them by the light of the fire. Nine? Twelve? The counting gets easier. Somehow the fire is growing steadily brighter, brighter and brighter, until she can feel the warmth of it even from here. But no, it's too bright, too warm. That can't just be from that fire. Besides, no one out there is feeding it. Then the screaming starts. Just a few muffled yells at first, rising to blood-curdling shrieks within seconds. Within a minute, the sound of a roof collapsing, sparks land on the tent and sear little holes into the material. The hostel. It's burning. The hiker wants nothing more than to break out of the tent and run to help, but the strangers surround her, doing nothing, just pinning her down, motionless, stinking. She blinks. They're gone. The pressure on her arm isn't there anymore. The shadows on the fabric are gone. Just the light from the fire remains. That and the smell still wafting in the air. The hiker gasps for air and receives a lungful of smoke. She throws herself forward and out of the opening in her tent. It is too late. The hostel burns fiercely, just as the morning sun crests over the horizon and the last droplets of rain fall at her feet. That morning, the hiker found herself standing right in the middle of SCP-1102. You see, this particular anomaly is not a creature at all, as you might have expected, but rather a region. Within the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia, USA, is a geographical area known for a disarming but ultimately harmless supernatural occurrence. Well, mostly harmless. Only occurring at night and during periods of rain or snow, a seemingly random area within the Blue Ridge Mountains will undergo a strange event. All of the corpses within that region will seemingly come back to life. This is no simple reanimation, however. The original bodies do not suddenly rise out of the ground. Instead, exact copies of those bodies appear. 
While these copies are close enough to the original person to fool observers from a distance, they fail to be all that convincing upon closer inspection. The skin is the biggest giveaway, looking somewhat deteriorated and different in color from the original person. The most obvious difference, however, is the behavior. Corpses created during an SCP-1102 phenomenon lack full brain function. While studies have found flickers of activity occurring between the neurons, it is nowhere near enough to sustain intelligent thought. These bodies find themselves driven by one simple and very human desire. They want company. Any corpses, human or otherwise, will seek the nearest crowd of their own species and gather with them. Beyond this drive, little is known about their motivations. Once with the group, they do not feed, reproduce, seek dominance, or even offer any social interaction. They just return to their nearest point of civilization, simply to be there. Until all of a sudden, they aren't there. When the sun rises after an SCP-1102 occurrence, every walking corpse simply disappears, along with the original corpse that it was copied from. Not a trace is left behind, unless, of course, you happen to get that smell trapped in your brand new tent. And this brings us to what was most unfortunate about the incident up at the hostel in the Blue Ridge Mountains that our hiker bore witness to. The fire that started had nothing to do with SCP-1102. All that happened was our friend in the blue coat felt so afraid of the stranger standing outside that he sat himself right up against one of the hearths inside, close enough for the edge of his coat to catch fire. While the whole building did burn down, rescue services only found eight bodies inside, far from the maximum capacity the hostel offered, almost as if everyone else crowded inside that building had mysteriously vanished. Of course, keeping an SCP like this one away from the public eye is no small task. Containing a seemingly random geographic phenomenon is virtually impossible without sealing off the whole mountain range. Instead, a group of dedicated agents has spent several years running an information operation instead. Taking the truth of these events and dressing them up as cliched ghost stories, the kind you tell around a campfire. So next time you sit across from someone toasting a marshmallow and telling you about a friend they once had, it might just be worth paying attention to. You never know who might be on their way to join you. If you want to support this important mission while also getting influence over the anomalies we cover and an exclusive look behind the scenes, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-3998, The Wicker Witch Lives, for more frightening remnants of the past coming back to haunt you. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.